Hello and welcome to EnglishLearn. After a long break, we're back with videos that help you pass your English exams. Today, we're talking about writing a review. Reviews are one of the most common text types that appear in AS level English exams and knowing the features of a review is very important. Although this video focuses on writing a review, a lot of the information we'll learn here will also be useful for analyzing a review in the reading portion of your exam. In this video, we'll learn about typical audiences for different types of reviews and how to tailor your review to suit different audiences, the purpose of reviews, why reviews need to be both objective and subjective and how to do that, how to get and keep the attention of the target audience, the language of reviews and how using descriptive and persuasive language can help improve the quality of your review and how to structure your review in the best possible way. But first things first, let's define reviews. Reviews are written accounts of the author's personal opinion and facts about a piece of art, place, product or service. Essentially, reviews offer insights, opinions and feedback based on individual experiences with the purpose of guiding and informing a specific audience. In your exam, you can be asked to write a variety of different types of reviews, including product reviews, service reviews, travel, food, book, music, film reviews, and so on. While some aspects of review writing depend on the type of the review, many features of reviews are common for all review types. Let's look at those features. We'll first look at purpose. In the real world, reviews influence consumer choices, shape opinions, and provide valuable insights about products and services. This means that the purpose of reviews is to inform people about the characteristics of a certain product or service. But what's even more important than that is that reviews have an element of persuasion, as they try to convince the audience that your opinion and point of view are correct. The next feature we'll talk about is audience. Audience varies depending on the type of review and where it is published. In this video, we'll focus on three typical kinds of audience, your peers, potential consumers, and enthusiasts or experts. The first type of audience for your review could be your peers. This is the case when the exam question asks you to write a review for a school magazine, for example. The students who read that magazine are teenagers just like you, so you can expect that you have a certain level of shared knowledge and interests. This also means that you can use a more casual and relatable tone, as well as references or inside jokes. The second type of audience are potential consumers. The exam question may state, for example, that your review will be published in the local newspaper. These are reviews written for a more broad, general audience. Potential consumers are people who are interested in trying the product or service you're reviewing, so they need in-depth information from you to help them make a decision to buy or not to buy the product. In your review, you need to be factual, informative, and transparent about your experiences and evaluations. Occasionally, the exam question may state that your review will be published in a specialized magazine or journal. This means you're writing for an audience of enthusiasts or experts in the subject. Let's say that the task asks you to write a review of a new car in a sports car magazine. The people you are writing for are car enthusiasts or experts who probably know a lot about the car industry. To suit the needs of this type of audience, you will need to offer them technical details, industry-specific terminology, and in-depth analysis. You need to show them that you are knowledgeable about the subject and that you have done your research. So what are some ways in which you can make sure that your review is tailored to suit the needs of your audience? Firstly, you can adjust your tone. Adjust the tone of the review to match the expectations and preferences of the audience. If you are writing for your peers, a conversational and informal tone might work best. You can address them directly, use informal expressions and common interests, and ask questions to engage them. Your tone should be personal, relatable, and approachable, and your vocabulary should be less technical. A more formal and informative tone is suitable for potential consumers. You can still address them directly and make occasional less formal remarks, but they're not your friends and you need to show them some respect in the way you write for them. Enthusiasts will most likely appreciate a technical and specialized tone. 
In terms of content, when writing for your peers, you should focus on relatable experiences and personal anecdotes. For potential consumers, emphasize the practical aspects and features of the subject. And for enthusiasts, dive into technical details, comparisons, and industry insights. You also need to choose your examples carefully. Use examples and anecdotes that resonate with your audience and are relevant for them. For example, if you are writing a movie review for film enthusiasts, reference iconic scenes or directorial choices. If your audience are potential book buyers, provide quotes and passages that highlight the book's strengths. While adapting your review to your audience, you also need to bear in mind that reviews are inherently subjective. They are meant to reflect your personal opinions and experiences. Subjectivity means that reviews offer the author's personal perspective and unique viewpoint. However, your reviews should not rely only on your opinions without any backing or evidence. In fact, all good reviews have two key components. They include opinions and facts. Your opinions need to be supported by specific evidence and examples. This evidence lends credibility to your review and helps your readers understand the basis of your evaluations. Now that we have covered the three big elements of writing reviews, audience, purpose, and tone, let's discuss the language of reviews. The word choices you make are a critical element that contributes to the effectiveness and impact of your review. The language you use can either enhance or diminish your ability to engage readers and convey opinions. A well-crafted review uses language strategically to engage, inform, and persuade. Reviews typically use descriptive language, persuasive language, jargon and specialist terminology, vivid verbs and adjectives, and evaluative lexis. Let's first look at descriptive language. Reviews use descriptive language to vividly convey the subject to the reader. Descriptive language helps the reader visualize the subject. To make a review more captivating, reviewers often use vivid imagery. This means they craft sentences that create mental images in the reader's mind. Vivid imagery appeals to the reader's senses, making the subject more relatable and immersive. Let's look at some examples of how vivid imagery enhances the quality of your sentences and your review overall. Here's the first example. The thrilling action sequences left the audience on the edge of their seats, heart pounding as cars careered through the bustling city streets. Impactful word choices, such as thrilling, heart pounding, careered, and bustling, all convey a sense of excitement and speed, helping the reader feel the thrill of the action. Here's the next example. The pristine, sun-kissed beaches stretched as far as the eye could see, their powdery sands meeting the crystal clear azure waters. Here, the reviewer helps paint the image of a beautiful, serene beach by appealing to the reader's sense of sight and touch. In your exam, you're expected to use specific vocabulary with strong connotations and vivid imagery to help your readers visualize the images you're explaining. However, although descriptive language is important, it is not enough. As we already mentioned, one of the purposes of your review is to persuade, so you will need to rely heavily on the use of persuasive appeals and techniques. Let's first look at the three persuasive appeals. These are ethos, which is appeal to credibility, pathos, appeal to emotions, and logos, appeal to logic. Ethos is the appeal to credibility. Ethos essentially means that you as the reviewer need to establish yourself as a trustworthy person who is knowledgeable about the subject you're discussing. To be persuaded by your words, the audience first needs to trust you. But how do I make them trust me, you ask? Well, there are several tools you can use. One of the ways that shows us we can trust a reviewer is his use of jargon and specialist terminology. If you're able to use words specific to film industry in your film review, your audience will perceive you as someone who knows what they're talking about. You should also showcase your expertise in the subject matter. You can portray yourself as the expert on the subject by highlighting your qualifications, experience, or background relevant to the subject being reviewed. Since you're a teenager, you're not really expected to do this in your writing exam. 
but this is a useful point to consider when analyzing reviews in the reading paper. Look for examples of the way the author positions himself as an expert in the field and analyze them as examples of the author establishing his ethos. The second appeal is appeal to emotions, pathos. Pathos means that you are trying to elicit an emotional response from the reader. You want to make them feel a particular emotion while reading your review, such as compassion, fear, or excitement. This can be done through using emotive language. Reviews often use words with strong positive or negative connotations to evoke emotions such as joy, excitement, nostalgia, or empathy. When you share personal anecdotes about things that happened to you, you are making the reader feel like they're part of those experiences. And finally, you can also appeal to their desires. Pathos can be used to tap into the desires and aspirations of the audience. For example, a product review may highlight how the item can fulfill the reader's dreams or desires. Finally, we have logos, which is appeal to logic. Logos involves using facts, statistics, and rational arguments to support the reviewer's opinions and recommendations. This can be done through providing factual information. A tech review might delve into the technical specifications of a product. This will appeal to tech-savvy audiences who need details about how the products work in order to make an informed decision on whether to buy the product or not. Comparisons. Logos can be used to compare the subject to others or to industry standards. For example, a product review might compare the reviewed item to its competitors and show how that particular product is superior to others. Data and evidence. For example, a health product review might reference scientific studies supporting the product's effectiveness. In addition to persuasive appeals, you will also need to use a variety of different persuasive techniques. You can find videos about different persuasive techniques on the channel. In technical and specialized reviews, you can use jargon and industry-specific terminology. It's crucial to adapt the use of jargon and terminology to match the familiarity of your audience with the subject. Finally, reviews use vivid verbs and adjectives to draw the reader into the experience, making the subject more relatable and appealing. Using specific verbs and adjectives also enhances the clarity of the review, because readers can form a precise mental image of the subject and its qualities. Vivid language evokes emotion and helps persuade the reader to take the reviewer's advice. Look at these examples and think about how using more vivid verbs and adjectives helps improve the quality of the review. The last element of language of reviews we'll discuss today is evaluative lexis. This is a fancy word for words that provide your opinion on something, words that evaluate. Evaluative lexis are words that express judgments, opinions, and assessments of the subject. It includes positive evaluations such as exquisite, stellar, transcendent, sublime. Negative evaluations like atrocious, banal, bland. Comparisons, like pales in comparison to, in a class of its own, second to none. Superlatives, unbeatable, the go-to, ultimate. This wraps up our discussion of language of reviews, so we can now talk about the structure of reviews. Although professionally written reviews don't necessarily follow a strict formal structure, in your writing, you will need to organize your points in a particular way. The most common way to structure your review is as follows. Title, introduction, summary, evaluation and analysis, key aspects, strengths and weaknesses, personal opinions, comparisons, conclusion, and rating or score. 
let's start with the title. While you may be tempted to overlook this part of your review, don't. The title is actually very important. It's the first thing a reader will see when they come across your review. If you were actually writing for some kind of an online publication, your title would be the determining factor of whether the audience will even click on your review and read it. This means it better be good. The purpose of the title is to grab your reader's attention, so you need to make sure your title is catchy and memorable. Here are some ways to do it. You can use powerful vocabulary, like heartfelt, genre-defining, hilarious, or mesmerizing. You can also use alliteration, as in the example, marvelous Mediterranean meals. You can use exaggeration, a journey of a thousand laughs, the funniest stand-up show ever. Rhetorical questions are also a good idea. Is this the ultimate fitness app? Finally, you can also use contrast, threads of tradition and rebellion, a fashion show review. This list is just a suggestion, and there are many other ways to make your title stand out and grab your reader's attention. After writing the title, you need to move on to your introduction. The introduction also serves the purpose of hooking the reader in and making him interested in reading the rest of the review. The introduction also needs to provide enough background information to make the reader understand the subject you're writing about. This means that your introduction needs to include two key components, a hook or an attention grabber and key background information. When writing your hook, you need to start with an engaging opening statement, a provocative question or a compelling anecdote that captures the reader attention. When writing key background information, you can set the stage for the review by providing essential information about the subject such as the title, creator, and the genre. After this, you will move on to the summary. In the summary, you will provide the essential information about the subject of the review. Make sure not to get into too much detail, but still provide enough information for the reader to understand what you're writing about. If you're writing a book or film review, make sure not to reveal too much information about the plot and spoil the experience for the potential consumer. After providing the summary, you can move on to evaluation and analysis. This part, which is the main part of your review, consists of four elements. Key aspects, strengths and weaknesses, personal opinions, and comparisons. You don't have to include these in this order, but these elements should be the focal point of the main part. In the key aspect, you need to identify and highlight the core content or components that are essential to understanding the subject. For example, in a book review, these key aspects might include the plot, characters, writing styles, and themes. In a product review, they could be the product's design, functionality, performance, and user experience. You need to write about the strengths and weaknesses of these key aspects. Express your opinions about what the subject does well and where it falls short. To make your assessment credible, back up your opinions with evidence and specific examples. Share your own feelings, emotions, and reactions to the subject. Express how the subject made you feel, whether it evoked strong emotions, resonated with you, or left you disappointed. Use vivid language and anecdotes to illustrate your personal responses. If applicable, you can also compare the subject to similar works, products, or experiences. Highlight what sets it apart and where it falls short in comparison to others. The conclusion of a review is your final opportunity to leave a lasting impression on your readers and summarize your evaluation. Don't introduce any new ideas in the conclusion. Instead, make sure to repeat your overall assessment and give recommendations to the audience. Restating the ideas you mentioned in your introduction is a good way to end the review, as it gives a sense of closure by using what is called cyclical structure. Optionally, you can include a rating or a score at the end of your review. Whether to include a rating or a score in your review depends on the type of review, the publication platform, and your personal style. So there you have it, a comprehensive guide to text features, language, and structure of reviews. I hope this video will benefit you in your exams. As always, share, like, and subscribe. And happy exam season, everyone.